Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, my name is Craig Bentz. Um, I'm in the work in the mayor's office, and I am the project manager for the study that you're going to be hearing about today. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your day today to hear more about the planning and development approval process study, which I'll just generically call the planning study from this point forward. Um, and that study is a comprehensive review of our current planning and development review processes with a goal of ensuring that our local planning processes are as efficient and as effective as possible. So over the course of about six months, and I believe we're about a third of the way into that, the study team is taking a look at best practices in other communities, identifying potential areas for improvement, um, talking with stakeholders, which is the purpose of our meeting today. We're uh, kicking off that stakeholder effort and also formulating recommendations for presentation to both the Planning Commission and the Urban County Council. So this meeting today is an informational session and a kickoff to the in-person stakeholder meetings that are being held next week on Tuesday and Wednesday, um, the 21st and 22nd. And I know many of you um, have already received invites for those sessions. Those will be small group meetings. They'll be held in the caucus room, which is on the second floor of the government center at 200 East Main. If you've been to the council chamber, it's right next to the council chamber. You'll see a door that's open right next to the, the typical door you would go into to the chamber there. And we look forward to hearing your thoughts and experiences with the, the city's current planning and development approval processes during those meetings. Those meetings, as well as today's meeting, will be led by Phil Walker with the Walker Collaborative, as well as the rest of his team, whom Phil will introduce shortly here. And um, we've included plenty of time for questions at the end of the presentation today as well. So we ask that you please raise your, your blue hand if you're used to using Zoom webinars. If you just uh, raise your hand when you think of a question, we'll bring you into the meeting and uh, we're glad to have that discussion. So the last thing I wanted to mention before I turn it over to Phil, I wanted to do a, a quick commercial for um, One Stop Lexington. So One Stop Lexington is an online one-stop shop we've been working on where you'll be able to complete due diligence tasks for potential development in the city, including identifying sites appropriately zoned for proposed use, uh, calculating permit fees, and even starting your permit application processes right online. This will be applicable for everything from a homeowner that wants to obtain a fence permit to a project team conducting due diligence site research before moving forward with a large project. One Stop Lexington will launch on March 8th and will be located online at onestop.lexingtonky.gov. So, and there will definitely be, definitely be more information about uh, One Stop Lexington out there over the next few weeks, but I knew this is an audience that would probably be interested in that. So with that, I will turn it over to, to Mr. Walker to tell you more about the planning study and introduce his team and, and discuss stakeholder engagement. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Craig. I appreciate it. So uh, my name is Phil Walker. I'm a, a planning consultant. Uh, I'm based in Nashville, Tennessee, although I'm a native of uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Spent a lot of time in Lexington over the years, particularly as a kid going over to Rupp Arena and visiting my, uh, have a family up in Cynthiana, Kentucky, which you might have heard of. So I'm really familiar with Lexington, uh, excited to be part of the project. And uh, I'm going to let my other uh, team members uh, present themselves uh, or, or introduce themselves. And I'm looking here, I don't know how they're sequenced on your all screen, but I see Craig Richardson. So I'll let you go first, Craig. Thanks, Bill. I'm Craig Richardson. I'm a director with Clarion Associates. Um, our firm does a lot of comprehensive planning work, and we do uh, an extensive amount of rewriting of development codes across the Southeast and, and the nation. We're based in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And don't hold that against them, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks, Craig. Keith, I see the X on the, on the frame here. Thanks, Phil. Uh, my name is Keith Covington. Uh, I um, uh, am an um, urban designer, uh, architect, and planner um, with uh, Common Ground Urban Design and Planning. I'm based in uh, Franklin, Tennessee. 
Um, and uh, I'm excited to be a part of this team and, and fit in where, where I can. Um, I spent five years with the city of Nashville's planning department before I uh, started my own firm. So, so I've been on both sides uh, and uh, hope to bring some of that knowledge and experience to the table. Thanks. Uh, Jeff, can you go next? Sure. Hi, I'm Jeff Green. I'm a senior associate with Clarion Associates. I uh, work with Craig Richardson um, and do a lot of uh, zoning code assessment and rewriting. Thanks. Great. Thank you. And we've got other uh, team members. I don't know if they're on this or not, and maybe I just can't see them, but um, assuming they're not on or, or I can't see them on my end, We've got uh, EHI consultants based in Lexington. Ed Holmes is on our team and Adam Clyer. Um, we've also got Prime AE Group with uh, Stephen Garland. And uh, Stephen does a lot of, uh, I guess, developer-related work in, in the area. So they're an important uh, other component to our team. So, uh, so that's it. Let me kind of go through uh, introductions we just did. Maybe I should have had that up when we were introducing um, so what we're going to do here for however much time we've got to, to meet um, is I'm going to give you just a little bit of background on the project overview. Great, uh, Craig did a great job of, of hitting on some of that already. And then the, the next few bullet points, I don't really want to go into detail. It's more a matter of reminding you of the kinds of things we're going to look at and study. And I really want to leave most of the time uh, for a discussion just to get people's input and their thoughts. But we are going to hit briefly on the relevant state statutes that Clarion Associates has researched. We're going to look at the existing approval processes and then uh, also look at the data that we've started to collect on past applications. Um, and then, and the, so if, as you can see at the top, kind of middle project objective, the main thing that we're going to be doing with this project is to, um, you know, look at your existing planning and development approval processes to see if there's any particular way we can find ways to improve on that. And the request for proposals uh, document that the urban county government issued for this project had this bullet point list of goals and outcomes. And this is not exhaustive. This is just kind of kind of some of the main points that they made. But, you know, we're going to look at how the current zoning and, and different processes align with the state statutes. We'll look at how the planning process occurs in other communities, which we've still got to identify which um, we're going to look at up to six other communities to see, you know, how they do things. Uh, look at the current process for variances, conditional uses, and administrative appeals. And, and not just that, those are the things that the Board of Adjustment uh, decides on, but also looking at the processes for subdivisions and development plans and uh, zoning, you know, rezonings, or that is map changes, I think is, is the term you all use, and uh, tax amendments to the ordinance. Um, we'll look at the technical review process and procedures. Uh, time frames. In other words, how long does it take for a typical application of a certain type to get through the process? Um, look at um, figuring out ways, is there some way to be more efficient and timely with the process? And then looking at the uh, Excella approval process. By the way, did I, Craig, is, do you pronounce it Excella? You got it. That's the way I pronounce it anyway. Okay. I'm this is, yeah, I've never used this before, so I was just guessing. Um, so that's what we'll call it, Excella. But, you know, looking at that whole, which, by the way, is a phenomenal resource for, you know, whether it's just citizens or or the development community, but uh, to kind of track where approvals are going. Um, this got a list of kind of key stakeholders. You know, these are the types of people. There are obviously others, but obviously the development community, um, planning commission members and staff and other folks involved with uh, land use policy, neighborhoods, uh, Commerce Lexington, which is an organization, community stakeholders that are identified by the Sustainable Growth Task Force. Those are just some of the key stakeholders. The, the process, and Craig hit on this a little bit before, but just to kind of walk you through, there are basically six major steps. The first one, which we've done quite a bit of already, is looking at the existing uh, process for, for different types of applications. Um, next week, you know, as it was mentioned, our team's going to be there. Uh, we're going to be out in the field on Monday and then meet with a lot of stakeholders Tuesday and Wednesday to start to get input and to start to really understand 
you know, the current situation. Task three is a comparison with other communities. And we'll, we'll start putting that list together, probably a lot more than six initially, maybe, you know, close to 10 communities that might be of a comparable size. Maybe some of them are even university communities, uh, hopefully at least in the region, and kind of figure out which are the ones we want to kind of focus on just to kind of understand how their processes work and compare it with uh, Lexington, Fayette County. Uh, task four is the um, putting together criteria for uh, for the process improvements. And then at that point, at the end of task four, the team will come back and we'll present our findings from task three and four and get further input. And then we go away and we put together the actual recommendations. And uh, then we'll come back at task six six present those and get feedback and, and finalize our report you know on the right there's just the the cover for our working document right now that we've already started to put together some of the task one findings in um and i'm just going to run through this real quickly this is just a, a set of statutes that clarion has identified that would relate to the approval process uh, for the urban county government. And in fact, uh, they, they sent me an updated version of this this morning that is not reflected right here, but you can kind of get a sense of what the types of uh, statutes are uh, for the state that relate to what we're doing here. The um, As far as the existing approval process goes, you know, if you look at some of the key departments or review bodies, there's obviously the Division of Planning, Division of Engineering, there's building inspection and a lot of other departments, but those are the three that might be most um, relevant for our study. And then there are a lot of review bodies uh, from starting at the top of the Urban County Council, the Planning Commission, Board of Adjustment, Board of Architectural Review, and then a whole host of other review bodies. And in fact, if you look at this slide, this is an excerpt from the Development Handbook. And you know, one thing that's really struck me about this project is that Certainly, there are a lot of committees, <laughs> and the approval processes are, are you know, somewhat complex, but at the same time, there are some really uh, user-friendly tools that, uh, that the urban county government has put together to help folks, you know, understand the process. So, yeah, you know, it's really impressive just to see, for example, a lot of this one document that kind of spells it out, and of course, they remind the reader constantly that if you, you know, don't rely solely on the information here, go to the actual, uh, you know, zoning code, but uh, but they do a really good job of distilling it all down. There are a lot of hyperlinks um, to, to things like, you know, a uh, uh, online tutorial for the Accela uh, portal and things like that. So anyway, uh, but obviously a lot of moving parts here. It's, it's also really important to understand these uh, kind of five different areas um, that, that are illustrated in this map that also came from the development handbook. And I probably should have se sequenced this in the opposite order. And I'm gonna start at the bottom because that's more of the way I, I tend to think. And, and if you look at the very middle kind of uh, outlined area, the Titus area, that's the infill and redevelopment area. And it's roughly 10 square miles. And uh, that was established in the 2001 Comprehensive Plan, and it's all around the downtown area. As you work your way out, you'll see in green, different shades of green, are the small area plans, and those are all based on uh, two different comp plans, the two, 2007 and uh, 2013 comp plans. Then there's the expansion areas that are in that kind of a beige color uh, that came out of the 1996 uh, expansion area master plan plan that wanted to make sure that if you are going to grow into into the rural service area that it be done in a way uh, that's that's you know sensitive to the environment of course it's now considered the expansion area the, those parts then the broader urban service area uh, the area that's not cross hatched around the periphery and that was established of course way back in 1958 which uh, underscores the fact that, that this this community has been a real pioneer uh, in planning for decades now. And then finally, the broader area with the cross hatching, of course, is a rural service area. And it's guided in particular by the 2017 Rural Land Management Plan and, and other uh, regulations and policies. So that's sort of the, the, the physical or geographic landscape of the process. Now, this table that you're looking at now 
came out of the development handbook. And, you know, there's a lot more uh, detail to all of this uh, once you look at, at different types of applications. But what I like about this is if you look at the columns um, to the left, you got planning staff, you know, who's involved with which kind of application and then committees to the right of that. And then a column full of the decision making bodies. And on the left, you've got these rows for the different types of applications. So the very, just to, as an example, if you look at the top one, variance, conditional use, administrative appeals, you can see which planning staff are involved with the review process. There are no committees actually on this particular one. And then of course, the folks who decide on those three topics are board, the board of adjustment. And, and you can kind of see how it's all laid out uh, as you go down you know, how these different, uh, the staff versus the committees versus, you know, who the decision-making uh, bodies are. Um, and then there's a whole series of flow charts, again, that came out of the development handbook that uh, show each major type of application. So here's just, you know, starting with the example of a zone change request. So the approving body is the, the council, uh, duration of time, and we may adjust these. This is what's in the development handbook right now, but as we analyze the actual data from the last five years, we may be adjusting all of these uh, numbers on the duration. Uh, but anyway, you can see that it's broken up into kind of three different parts. There's the, the preparation of the application with kind of four steps, followed by the, the review process, five, six, and seven, followed by the hearings, and the, the decision making. And there's this little key that you'll see in the upper right that I thought was kind of clever the way that's been used in the development handbook that shows which uh, groups, you know, entities, staff, whatever are involved at these different stages. Um, sticking with uh, the, the council and what they approve, the zoning ordinance text amendments. And uh, again, you see there's the, the preparation of the application. There's the review process, steps four, five, and six. And then there's the hearings and decisions in seven and eight. And then so minor subdivision, the easiest thing, this is actually administratively approved by staff. Uh, and that's one to three months. And you can see that's pretty straightforward. On the other hand, major subdivisions, not quite as, as easy. Uh, it's the planning commission that approves. Uh, it can be one to three months. Um, there are probably the most steps of all in this, maybe the development plan as well. It, it has a lot of review and steps, but you can see kind of the layout of all these. Um, and then there's development plans. And again, that's the planning commission. Uh, staff can approve some minor amendments to those. And those can be anywhere from six, six weeks to three months in time. And then finally, variances, conditional uses, and administrative appeals that are done by the Board of Adjustment. And that's usually a one to three month period, depending on which kind of application you're looking at. Um, this is something, and it's not the most current version. Clarion put this together. Uh, Craig and Jeff put this together for me. Sent me a new one this morning that I didn't have time to get in here. I, and I didn't expect you to actually be able to read all this, but uh, it just kind of gives you a sense of, uh, you know, their look at it on, on how to break it up between, and if you look at, I'll just take the, the, there's actually several more pages that are just notes, but if you look at the page on the far left, and there's a little highlighting under con comprehensive plan amendment, um, you know, across the top, the columns are, are the, um, and I'm looking here at my hard copy version, the uh, procedure. So in other words, you got the division of uh, building inspection, next over the, the next column to the right division of planning, Historic Preservation Commission, Board of Architectural Review, Board of Adjustment, Planning Commission, and then the Council. And then as you go down the, the rows on the left column are the different types of applications. So um, it's very similar to the one chart I showed you before, but just goes into more detail. And again, that's been updated. And then the last thing I want to hit on before we just open it up for conversation is the data that we've been getting. And the initial wave of data we got wasn't in the in the most user-friendly format for us to use, but but we're getting, fortunately, the staff's doing a great job of kind of trying to uh, tabulate some of these figures for us. This is the initial thing that, that was sent, though, as far as different types of applications. And notice, if you look at the bullet points 
up here, we, we don't say app, just application or action because the majority of these 38% are planning, zoning, compliance, and complaints. So that's not an application. That's just, I guess, what you would call an action. So you can really almost take that off the board because that's not something that we're going to be real focused on. Here's a, uh, a table that, that has the same information. Now, this table, though, is a little more uh, applicable to what we're looking at because it looks at these major different types of applications. It shows you um, like where it says total count, that middle column, that's over a five-year period from 2018 through 2022, the total number. So if you look at Board of Adjustment Administrative Appeals, over the five years, there were 65 of them. Average uh, age, that is the average amount of time from the application to um, the resolution of, you know, with a decision was about 45 days. So that's that's kind of interesting. One thing we got to figure out, though, is how are we going to use all this data? Because it's it's nice to look at, at bar graphs and charts, but we, we need to figure out, you know, what, what's this really going to tell us? I think one thing it'll tell us is when we start looking at these other communities and how they do things to just kind of compare, well, you know, how many, how many different types of applications do they get each year? What's the average amount of time it takes uh, to get through the process and that sort of thing? So I just, using... The Board of Adjustment is just one example because I, I got most of the stuff the other day and haven't, haven't had a chance to kind of translate it into uh, infographics. But this is just one example for the Board of Adjustment uh, for those five years, the number of applications they got between variances at 104, conditional uses at 88, and then 65 administrative appeals. Um, here's the average number of, uh, there's a typo, annual, it's supposed to be applications by type. Um, so that's the average, you know, annually over the last five years. And th this is the average number of days by application type over the last five years. So, you know, we're going to get into a lot more of this stuff when, when I have time to to digest all the stuff that I, that I got recently. But those are the kinds of things we'll look at as far as st statistics go. So with all that said, um, I'd love to hear people's comments or questions or, you know, thoughts on the approval process uh, as it stands right, right now. So if you are attending and, and watching this and would like to be brought into the conversation here with um, observations or questions, any sort of comments, please um, raise your hand. You should see, I think it's at the bottom of your screen should see a, a little raise hand icon there. If you hit that, I'd be glad to uh, bring you into the meeting. Don't be shy. <laughs> By the way, I'm seeing, now that I can increase the size of my little thumbnails, I can see more of my team members. We've got Steve's there. Thanks, Steve, for being part of it. Adam uh, with EHI there. Those two guys are both in Lexington and uh, glad to have them part of this as well. So I'm not, oh, Aaron Masterson has just raised her hand. I'll bring you into the, the meeting here, Aaron. All right, you can go ahead, Aaron, if you're in the meeting here. Hey there, can you hear me? Sure can. I'll be the guinea pig and start the questions for you guys. <laughs> we appreciate it. Yeah, just a softball one. Just curious if you guys, um, you know, we have some meetings scheduled next week in person, and I'm just curious what maybe you're looking for today versus like that end meeting person. What kind of questions or discussion points? What's the difference between today's meeting and, and next week? Yeah, I guess uh, the biggest difference would be that with next week, you know, we've got these individual stakeholder groups. You know, for example, one will be with a development community. Another will be with uh, maybe neighborhood representatives. So each individual group brings its own set of kind of issues and perspectives and interests. So I think um, the biggest difference would be that we try to kind of uh, dig in a little deeper on the, the issues for those particular groups versus a little bit more of a broad brush um, focus of, of this meeting. Okay, um, I can I can uh, or I can provide some of my own personal comments in addition to next week. 
Um, I think in general, I've provided comments back to standing staff, planning staff in the past about how there's sometimes it feels like a lack of transparency into the process. You know, I was actually uh, part of the group that helped develop the development handbook. Um, but even with that, you know, the technical review committees or some of the meetings, there's there's almost like a sense of like, oh, well, most people have been through that so often that they know what to expect when they walk in the room. But if you're a somebody who has never been there before, only been there a few times, it's there isn't a lot of direction or understanding of what to expect when you walk into those committee rooms. So uh, there's a lot of people that are there at every single one of them and they know the drill. But if you're new, it can be somewhat intimidating and, and there's just a lack of understanding of what to expect. Right. And do you have any ideas on what we might do to try to make it uh, more transparent? I, you know, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, like, for example, I don't know with some of these review meetings how open to the public they are. I mean, I don't know if that's one option is to making certain types of meetings more open or providing a record, although there's so much paperwork and work already generated by the process to begin with. I, I'm not saying that's necessarily the answer, but any any specific thoughts that you might have? Yeah, I think it's more of like how the meeting will be run. You know, like you're, I think it's sometimes it's first come, first serve, first serve. sometimes it's not. Um, you're, there's a generally a round table of people and no one's wearing name tags. You don't know who they are unless you're there all the time, you know? So like it could be a KU representative. It could be a stormwater quality representative, but you don't know them and you don't know their names and you're supposed to be responding to their questions and then following up with them, but there was no introduction. And so there's just a lack of like, who am I talking to? <laughs> and only if you are there all the time, do you begin to know those people? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. I think we've all been in a meeting where somehow you ended up in this meeting and you're all around a table and you don't really know <laughs> who the participants are. And it, it can be a little bit disturbing and confusing. So I totally agree. Yeah, that if you're not sort of a, a quote regular at, at those meetings, that it might be might be tricky. So that, that sounds like a fairly easy, easy fix. But yeah, I realize there's more to that issue than just uh, knowing who's who. But that that's a really good observation. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, also, no problem. I also see that Mr. Gaffield has his uh, hand up. I'm going to bring him in as well. Seems to be a bit of a lag when I do that, so hopefully, it, hopefully, he's showing up here shortly. Yep, Mr. Gaffield. Mr. Gaffield, if you're in the room, you have the floor. <laughs> I think his mute button's on. Yeah. Oh, is that what it is? I can't see him on my Just screen here. Yeah I, yeah, I didn't see it at first. There you go. But, um, uh, I'm Luke Gaffield. I'm president of Fayette County Neighborhood Council. I, I know, I mean, I think we'll bring a list of things that we think need to be looked at. Um, a lot of it has to do with process and transparency. Uh, and, and we've had thoughts on this probably for 20 years or so, and, the, and some of the problems haven't changed. There was a council committee set up to work on improving the uh, planning process 20 years ago, and, and not a whole lot came from it. So I think we'll have a lot for you about how the process works. There's going to be some uh, conflict in what we bring in the sense that if you're going to have better transparency and a better process, where neighborhoods know what's going on, it's going to take more time rather than less, and you're going to be working on efficiency. So there's, it's going to be an interesting project, and, and we'll engage in it. Uh, we'll meet next week uh, for sure. Uh, I think we have an hour, but we also will develop a probably a written list of things to work with. We, I don't think we'll have that done by next week, but we will have something. I've got some definite ideas. Great. Thanks, Walter. Appreciate that. Hey, Phil, can you stop sharing your screen? I think that might make it a little easier. I'm only seeing some of the attendees, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, let me uh, figure out how to... Uh, I want to get out of...
And while you do that, um, Richard Murphy's hands up and I'm going to bring him into the room as well. That's perfect, thank you. Yep. There we go. Hi, Mr. Murphy, if you'd like to unmute, you feel free to uh, address the group. Yeah, uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm a lawyer who works in the development process, mainly for developers. I just wanna know what your ground rules are gonna be. And when we come to the meetings, are our comments gonna be treated anonymously uh, and tabulated? Um, I mean, and how many, how many feedback sessions do you have? I know I'm scheduled for the one Wednesday morning, but I've, I've communicated with some of my colleagues and that is scheduled to the same time that a technical committee meeting is being held where we have to attend. So, so we may not be able to attend that meeting. If we cannot attend, is there some alternative way we can participate in that? Right, so as far as ground rules, you know, we'll obviously have a record of who participated in the meeting. Uh, we don't have any way to really tabulate. We, you know, we, we don't try to tabulate comments, for example. We also, when we write notes, we uh, we don't identify who said what. Um, so it's, as much as anything, we want people to be frank and comfortable and being straightforward with their thoughts. And so we don't quote people. Um, and then I think the other part of your question, for folks who can't make some of these meetings, we can figure out a way to at least, at, at the very least, have a telephone call um, or a Zoom meeting. You know, maybe we'll set up a Zoom meeting with a handful of people who wanted to participate but couldn't make it. Or I can just, you know, talk with people individually. So, um, yeah, that's kind of our approach to it. Okay. Well, appreciate that. Yeah, also probably worth we're saying if you if you can't attend the meeting and you have some comments that you'd like passed along to the team, please feel free to email those to me directly. Um, and I'm glad to share that with the, the study team as well, if that hasn't been said. Okay. How long do the meetings or, or do you plan for the meetings to last? I think I think uh, Craig, re remind me, I know some of them will go like an, an hour 15 and others like an hour. Yeah, they, they vary a bit just based on size of the group because we want to make sure everybody has a chance to be heard. So they are varying between 45 minutes and an hour and a half, I believe, is the longest one. And there, there are six of those meetings in total. I, th I think the 45-minute ones from the latest tweet to the itinerary, we actually got up to an hour, didn't we? I think that's uh, that. That may be the case. We, I, th I think you're right. I think we had to increase it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Philip, on the agenda for the uh, people like Mr. Murphy who can't, might not be able to make the planning development, don't we have a makeup later that afternoon, the additional meeting? Would that be appropriate for them to attend it, or would that be covering something else? So I don't remember any sort of uh, kind of just, you know, open meeting where that was, like each one, for example, was a specific type of stakeholder. Um, so I don't remember us having that. But again, we can be flexible. I mean, we will definitely talk with anyone who wants to talk with us um, and, and, and get their input. So, you know, feel, you know, rest assured that that we're going to listen to what folks have to say. And, you know, even if they miss a meeting that they would have liked to have attended, we'll, we'll talk to them anyway. So, um, yeah, but, but we can, we can kind of cross that bridge, I guess, when we get to it. There's a question um, that someone typed in, Daryl Near with uh, Lexington Habitat is asking, could the questions for next week's small groups be shared prior to the meeting? So that's similar to what we had discussed before. I don't know if, if we have really a template of, of questions at this point, do we, Phil? No, and and typically, I mean, the way these meetings go, they're first of all, they're they're fairly informal, uh, and we start off, you know, everybody introducing themselves. I explain the the 
the project, you know, what the purpose is, what the key steps of the project are. And then we just, you know, find out what their issues are with the approval process. And so I don't necessarily go in, you know, I might for some groups have at least a handful of real specific questions, but um, I'm not sure when I'd, I'd have that available. So we really just kind of see what the issues are and where the conversation goes and make sure people can, you know, convey their, their thoughts and opinions. That sounds good. I'm bringing uh, Brandon Gross into the meeting right now. There he is. Hi, Brandon. Feel hey, free guys. to. Thanks. I'm at uh, home fighting off uh, some kind of virus or cold. Um, but I guess this really goes back to uh, Dick's question. Um, it looks like I'm scheduled for the 9 a.m. Uh, February 22. Um, also, and I didn't know if – does it appear that most of the practitioners are in that group, Craig? Because if so, we may want to reschedule it um, or maybe switch it just because if we – if Dick and Nick and a bunch of us are in tech review um, – it, it may not be a beneficial group if that's kind of where we got placed or if there are engineers that are in that group too. I, since none of us know who's been invited to what group, um, yeah, it's hard to say, but th that one may be one where it's going to help the process if that one gets switched or rescheduled to a different time period if a sure. bunch of the practitioners are there. And that's all I had right now. No, that's a good comment. And, and that group in particular – um, I'll I'll take a look uh, probably tomorrow to make sure that we're seeing all of the responses from who can be there and who can't. But if it's looking like the majority of participants cannot be there, we might we might get a little bit more creative with that group in particular and try to. That may end up being a Zoom meeting just so everybody can can truly attend because I know schedules are tough to to get aligned for these type of things. Um, so we'll we'll definitely take a look at that by day and tomorrow and and be in contact with, with you all if that if that needs to be adjusted. One other thought, Craig, is that if there's like just a small, you know, handful of people who can't make a particular meeting, that's kind of the stakeholder group they fit into, but they can make another time slot. You know, this isn't a, a scientific process. If, you know, if you had a, if you had an engineer and maybe sitting in on the, a neighborhood group. I don't think that's the end of the world. I mean, we like to kind of focus mainly on what the issues are for that particular stakeholder group, but it, it's it's not a big deal if someone just got it on another group as well, so. Gotcha. I'll look at that as well if there's a couple of other time slots where we don't have a lot of people already in that particular stakeholder group. So we'll, we'll be in touch. That's a great comment, Brandon, something something we've been kind of looking at as we've been receiving comments. So we'll, we'll be in touch with more information on that. Not seeing any other hands. Anybody have uh, any other uh, comments or questions for the group here? It's not looking like that's the case. I think we're done. Um, thank you everybody for, for attending today. Um, we will, as I just said, we'll be in touch tomorrow with a, our meeting reminder, as well as, you know, to make any adjustments if we need to, to those meeting times and so on. Um, if, if you can just be thinking about uh, comments and, and input that you'd like to share with this group next week during the in-person meetings, that'll make those meetings more useful, I think, for, for us. If you can't attend any of the meetings, um, again, feel free to get in touch with us either by phone or email. We can either set up um, a Zoom meeting to chat with you or, or adjust, you know, we'll figure out a way to meet with you is what I'm trying to say there. Um, any closing words, Phil? No, I just um, I appreciate people participating with this. We look forward to being there to, um, next week. And, you know, we, we've got a whole list of different sites that might relate to, you know, development sites related to the project that we're going to check out on Monday. And then uh, we look forward to meeting with folks on Tuesday and Wednesday. So thanks for uh, or organizing all this, Craig, and uh, I think it went well.
Certainly. The only um, closing comment I'd like to make is that we are looking at right around June um, to report out kind of the, the final um, recommendations that come out of all of this. So please stay tuned. We'll, we'll make sure we're communicating with the stakeholders as this moves forward, and we'll be in touch to also let you know about those meetings as they come up so you can attend. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks. We'll be in touch Thank soon. You.